is Dr. Tanio uh, from Texaco Corporation. She is speaking on FDI IR analysis of phosphate and borate from promoted nickel molybdenum alumina hydro treating catalyst precursors. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to to add my thanks to Bob for taking time out to uh, listen to me. I, uh, I started working at Texaco, I think, 30 years, 40 years after Bob. And when he started working, they asked him what he'd want to work on. When I started working there, they handed me some bottles of catalyst and said, here, go do some work. And uh, I found the uh, IR instruments uh, available, so I started doing some work. And, and, and Bob uh, took time out to, to, to listen to me, and, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm going to talk about uh, hydrotreating uh, catalysts and uh, specifically uh, phosphate and uh, borated promoted uh, catalysts. But why uh, hydrotreating? Well, people know really what the reaction is, but uh, the, uh, all the environmental reg regulations are putting a big burden on the refineries to uh, increase uh, hydrotreating uh, capabilities. And I'm told that. Uh, Refiners are, are faced with two options, either build new hydrotreaters, which can cost upwards of one or two hundred million dollars, or try and uh, identify uh, better catalysts and to uh, increase the throughput. So there's tremendous financial uh, incentive to developing better catalysts. And um, this is how we uh, sell this kind of work to our management. Uh, we, the approach is to, to Kind of develop techniques to study catalysts, to to use this to understand how catalyst composition, uh, preparation, and pretreatments and effective promoters affect the surface chemistry, and then to try and correlate uh, our measurements with uh, uh, reactor data to to understand structure reactivity uh, 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 relationships, and then based on this to to uh, design new catalysts. And you can see with, with terms like design parameters, this, this slide was used to, for a management talk. They love that kind of thing. And they don't, uh, so well, my talk is going to focus a little bit on this area, trying to relate IR data to, to kind of uh, structure char uh, characteristics that will affect um, the activity. And as I said, um, I'm going to look at uh, phosphate and uh, uh, borate promotion. Both of these are known to affect the HDN and HDS activities. And what I'm going to do is pretty much go in and talk about some phosphate work and then to, um, to talk uh, talks about the borate. But really, the, when I went through my files to pull out some data, I thought really what I wanted to do is, is, is show some data that illustrates how how sensitive this technique is and how useful it can be to, in the study of multi-component supported uh, uh, metal systems. And really, so just some nice data I'm showing you. This is how we prepare these catalysts, and uh, I've shown here for phosphate, uh, uh, phosphate take alumina. Uh, for the case of phosphate, we, we add phosphoric acid, and then we dry it, and then we uh, impregnate with uh, ammonium heptamolybdate uh, and calcine to form the uh, phosphorus molybdenum on alumina and then we impregnate uh, the nickel and we dry in calcine. This is called sequen sequential impregnation. Of course we can co-impregnate all of, all of the components and in fact this is how phosphate happened to be there in the first place. In a, you can't dissolve, you can't, uh, dissolve uh, molybdenum and nickel in the same uh, up together, you need some acid, and they found that if you use phosphoric acid, that had a positive effect. If you, if you just, just uh, aside, if you want to make uh, phosphated catalysts this way, you have the best way is to put your phosphate on first well, uh, before the metals. And I'm going to show you some borate catalysts. In the, in the case of borate, what you have to do is put the boric acid on last. If you put borate on first, you're no good. So the, the way the, the sequence of putting uh, these uh, components onto the onto the um, alumina is very important. And the probe molecule that uh, actually I'm going to talk about today is is, is, is NO, and this slide really illustrates why it's such a nice 
probe molecule. Uh, here I've got NO on, on this, is a, this, did, this four denotes a full weight percent nickel. See a nice band at about uh, 1874, which is NO absorbed on the nickel. And the, with the molybdenum, you uh, get the two bands due to the, this dinitrosyl species. And then if you uh, have both, both metals present, <coughs> you can clearly see uh, all the two bands, um, the two due to the molybdenum and the one due to nickel. So it's a very nice uh, probe molecule for this. If I was to use CO, uh, CO on, absorbed on nickel and molybdenum just gives one great big lump. You can't uh, distinguish the two, two metals. So this is why this is a nice uh, probe molecule. And you can, if you, here I've got, uh, you can study reduced and sulfide uh, catalysts. Uh, a nice uh, pl uh, cleaner spectrum is, is, is the reduced, um, uh, NO absorbed on the reduced catalyst. If you sulfide, you can see that uh, you get this, this shift in the bands due to the change in electronegativity of the, uh, of the uh, of going from uh, uh, oxide to, to, to sulfide. And of course, you can see that the, the no, it's a lot noisier. Some catalysts get black. And during my talk, I'm going to flip from sulfide <coughs> to reduce the four rays of catalyst. Uh, the catalyst just gets so black that transmittance spectroscopy is uh, not very good. That's, that's where we go. Uh, people have gone to uh, uh, reflectance spectroscopy. So you can, but we can see a shift down when we sulfide these catalysts. So. I use this slide now to lead me into uh, phosphate. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, I, IR and NMR analysis of, of phosphated uh, nickel molly, molybdenum catalysts. And we know that phosphoric acid reacts with the alumina hydroxyls initially to form monomeric uh, orthophosphates and then polymeric orthophosphates and then after a, uh, low, uh, uh, sufficiently high loading of uh, phosphate, I think it's about two or three weight percent, you start forming the bulk phases of, of aluminum phosphate. Uh, molybdenum, on the other hand, um, as a function of lo um, molybdenum loading on alumina, first start with kind of tetrahedral molybdate, and then as you increase the molybdenum loading, you go to more octahedral molybdate, and you increase the loading even further, you get bulk phases of um, molybdenum trioxide and aluminum molybdate. But what we found that for a given molybdenum loading, uh, again, we used about 8 weight percent, if you added up to about 1.1 uh, and a half weight percent phosphorus, you convert, or the tendency to form the uh, tetrahedral molybdate it, it decreases, you start form, uh, you promote the formation of the more octahedral uh, molybdate. And then if you, go, if you increase the uh, loading more, you start forming bulk phases of the molybdenum uh, trioxide and the aluminum molybdate. Now, there's two, two, the phosphates could be doing this in, in two ways. One, uh, we know that the, the orthophosphates that form on the alumina have some uh, acidic, so, um, so we, we think that could possibly be altering the, uh, an equilibrium between the tetrahedral and the octahedral molybdate. Or, and also, uh, especially at the higher loading, you start getting some uh, physical blocking of the alumina. So this is kind of a, a summary of a lot of work we've been doing. Um, I'm going to show you some little hodgepodge of data, and again, it's really just to show you how sensitive this technique is. Um, this is, in fact, probably the best thing is not to look at reduced, just look at the sulfided uh, catalyst. And we can see uh, that how the, the structure of the catalyst surface structure is affected by uh, preparation method. You can clearly see that uh, the top, on the top, um, figure, uh, top spectrum is where it's made by co-impregnation. You can clearly see that uh, the, intensity, the overall intensity is a lot higher, and you've got a lot more of, of the nickel on the surface. This, you can understand this in, uh, um, in, in terms of the uh, nickel and molybdenum perhaps being in closer contact solution and to form the alumina, still in closer contact, the nickel doesn't get a chance to, to go into the uh, into the alum aluminum uh, lattice. So as I said this is a this this IR clearly can show show the difference between these two uh, methods. 
as a function of uh, phosphate loading, and this is keeping uh, the nickel and molybdenum the same, you clearly see that, uh, there's a, that phosphate um, changes the, the structure. You see that as you increase the loading, the nickel, uh, the intensity of the nickel band goes up to about one, uh, one weight percent. I think also the, the molybdenum does also, but it's really clearly see the nickel goes up and then after about after one percent you start seeing the intensity going down the um, intensity this intensity decrease is because of uh, metal uh, phosphate species being formed um, this uh, this um, I think this this increase is due to again the change in, in um, uh, molybdenum um, uh, structure but the you know, in, we here, see here the uh, maximum about one weight percent phosphorus, uh, phosphorus and going to, we found some literature data. Unfortunately, I haven't, we didn't get the other data on my other catalyst, but we have this, some data in the literature. You clearly see that the, uh, the maximum activity is seen at about uh, one weight percent. So we, we are kind of a, get a visual correlation between RIR data and uh, reactor data. And just on this work, it summarizes uh, stuff. Uh, we, we know, and it's very important, that the, uh, the surface structure is affected by a preparation method, and that um, there's greater density of, of uh, nickel sites on when you prepare by uh, catalyst by co-impregnation versus sequential impregnation. Um, I, I didn't show you, but uh, the way if we're sequential impregnating, the catalyst um, structure changes, and uh, the, the density of the NO absorbing sites correlate with published HTS activity. The, there's other literature data by other uh, people that uh, show uh, this kind of, uh, this, kind of um, this kind of result. Uh, going to uh, bore rate now. Kind of quite fast here. Um, we found that we couldn't uh, study sulfide catalysts, they get very black and um, it's very noisy, so I'm, I'm going to switch back to, to reduced uh, catalysts. And as I said, it's very important that uh, these kind of catalysts that uh, we add, you add more uh, acid glass. Um, if what we see here is a function of, uh, of uh, 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 borate loading that in fact the intensity, I don't know if it's clear here, but the intensity of all the bands go down and you see an increase in, in um, bands due to uh, borate on the surface. And we've done some kind of curve analysis of, of, of this, corrected for weights of wafers and things, and we, clear, we, can, we see that uh, the function of uh, bore loading, the uh, the intensity, uh, the density of nickel sites goes down quite. Uh, oh, this, this is molybdenum goes down. Also, the intensity of the intensity of the, uh, of the nickel sites go down. In fact, the nickel drops uh, a lot more. So we're also, we're forming a lot of uh, uh, metal bore weights on the surface. Um, however, if we if we uh, if we get, take the HDS activity, we see a, a very nice correlation between the HDS activity and the intensity of, of the uh, uh, molybdenum um, bands, uh, which, which uh, is in keeping uh, with, uh, with, with um, what we understand that the HDS is, 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 uh, occurs sites related to the, the molybdenum. And uh, as I said, if you add bore rates, the trouble is if you do form a boric acid, you form a lot of bore rates. We did find that if you, uh, we've done a lot of work putting boric, boric, boric onto the catalyst, and if probably best if you don't calcine the catalyst prior to putting them in the reaction, just put boric acid on and you just dry it and, and put it in into the reactor. We uh, also, uh, I think I, I started putting uh, borate on, um, probably because uh, borate aluminum is a good uh, acid catalyst. 
and, uh, and of course, uh, want to know how how the borate uh, changes the acidity. Now, this isn't the best. Um, this isn't the best uh, graph to sh uh, see with respect to show this, uh, but clearly we can see that uh, on this calculus we can see the uh, the band due to the uh, bronze acidity and the Lewis acidity. Um, and so this is not the best spectrum, but we have um, taken a series of this data and gained a very careful uh, curve analysis and uh, show that the increase in the, uh, there's an increase in the uh, density of the bronze acid sites with, with uh, boron loading. And that furthermore, um, furthermore the uh, HDN activity correlates uh, <coughs> uh, with the uh, Ronsted acidity. I've shown one piece of data, uh, one, I've got one correlation here. I think we've done this on four or five catalysts and see the same uh, same uh, correlation. And, uh, and of course this is what, what keeping with a, um, kind of the mechanism whereby the, uh, the nitrogen has to be uh, protonated of the uh, carbon-nitrogen uh, bond. And uh, so just to summarize this, before I go to a, a summary of all my work here, uh, we, uh, for the borate, the addition of uh, borate, uh, borate decreases both the nickel and the molybdenum uh, size due to metal borate formation. The HDS activity decreases with uh, borate uh, loading. This is because we are um, really decreasing the amount of uh, uh, molybdenum present, but as we increase uh, um, the borate loading, the Bronsted acidity um, is increased, and this, um, this leads to an increase in the HDN activity. And we clearly see this for, se for several uh, catalysts, that as we increase the borate loading, the HDS goes down, but the HDN goes up, up to a, a certain level of, uh, of um, uh, bore rate. And, um, and I guess that's all I wanted to say. I really, as I said, I, my goal here was really just to show that this technique is very, very powerful and that it, you can learn a tremendous, tremendous uh, amount of information from, from this uh, somewhat relatively simple um, technique. And uh, I, I, I might say it actually works. We, I have three or four patents now pending. Some have been, some have been issued. And, and basically, we've taken information. Or I've taken information from this kind of work, tweaked um, catalysts, and we have 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 uh, improved the activity enough to, um, to get patents. In fact, actually, some patents have been issued to us. So that's all I wanted to say. And again, thank you very much. For Inviting me. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yeah, uh, Can you, uh, have you been able to identify the, the source of the Brunstad acidity? Is it on borate or is it on molybdenum? No, we didn't. Uh, we well, hope you've got no idea what it is. No, really. Um, I might tell you, tell you um, we were hoping to do some um, NMR. We hope, this, uh, I might have to tell you this project got cancelled, so we were like in the middle of, so um, of getting this. <laughs> well, I'm not um, so I, I, we had kind of got these things all set out to do some more work and we couldn't do it. Uh, I, I might tell you though that you, uh, one, th one patent has got issued, we, you can actually add, take a spent catalyst that the activity has, has, has decreased and add some boric acid, throw it back in and regenerate the acidity. So that kind of suggests that it's, it's actually on the, that it's on the board for the uh, Do you have any, any, yeah. any, any idea of the relative strength of this acid? No. Okay. <clears throat> I've always thought it's kind of curious that when you have low loading of molybdenum, even though you put heptic molybdate on at pH 7 or 6 or 7, get these uh, tetrahedral uh, form. Now, uh, when you put
put the, 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 the uh, phosphate, phosphoric acid on first, uh, do you suppose that, uh, that they, they preferentially go to these sites that, that form tetrahedral? In other words, can you still get tetrahedral stuff formed after you have uh, put the, the phosphoric acid on? I guess that's um, that's a question as to whether it's a blocking effect or whether you yeah. you've changed the equilibrium. And I can't, I'm afraid, I never we didn't do careful enough work to address that. To really, well, um, I probably uh, probably probably that it's a bit of both. Actually. Do you have a question back there? Yeah, I tend to ask the question, but you you already answered my answer to Professor Corbin. About the origin of uh, the do, do the Lewis sites stay constant while the Bronsted and activity changes, no. or um, they went down slightly? And, and, I and guess the activity I went up while they went down. Yeah. Actually, I did too. We did look at the hydroxyl region of these, but I still still don't think I can address that question. Uh, Bob indicated in Texaco that he didn't have uh, too much difficulty when he wanted to uh, present papers. Has that attitude uh, changed any over the years uh, <laughs> with well, getting clearance? Well, I tell you, I have to just tell you, I, I work, I've been working at Texaco for, for what's it, seven years, and during that time they actually paid for me to get my PhD, and everything I did was published. So we, we went through a time where we could almost, or at least in my area, we could publish. Mm -hmm. Things are tightening up now. We, I can tell you what, the bean count is in charge now. And they, they, don't want, they don't want to release anything for fear that it will, uh, any of fear that uh, it might be useful down the line. So things are, things are tightening up. Yes, I, I would think anything on which you are getting patents would be something they I, would worry about displaying. I can only do this now because it's all been, uh, it's all, they've all been filed and uh, uh, even being issued now. So without that, I could. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have any other questions? Uh, oh, we'll, we'll take about two-minute break here. Our